joins to being recorded. I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, I'm just going to wait for a couple of minutes and then we're going to promote um, our moderator, Paul Siegel, and our other panelists, Alfredo Sardvilo and Guy Standing, two um, panelists. But we'll have to wait for a little bit to, to, for that to happen. Um, I just. So let's see if we can find. Yep, Guy is here. So let's promote to a panelist. Perfect. And hello, everyone. Hello, Alfred. Apologies. We're relieved. I've been waiting for some time. Apologies. Oh, bless you. In classic, yeah, it's typical Zoom to fail at the last hurdle. Um, I will just get all on who we are just waiting for. Hello, Guy. Hello, Guy. Sorry about that delay. I'm um, here. Hi there. We're all on. We've all made it. Um, oh, yep. Yeah. I was just, I was just waiting for the link to start. I know. I, for some reason, it's taking an attending list, but it's all good. It's all good. Um, so, as we introduced earlier on, this is the first panel of a series of five for the Conflict Security and Development Conference. Um, really, the conference is all about kind of engaging with critical issues in conflict security and development, and this year we're doing it from the lens through the lens of inequality. So this panel is all about COVID. It's called COVID and Global Inequality, Assessing the Dynamics of Disparity. And really the crux of it is understanding that COVID isn't just a health crisis. It's also um, the exasperation of multiple inequalities, uh, both within country and around the world. Um, so this panel will be an opportunity to explore those different inequalities, to understand why particular groups experience COVID in a more acute way than others, understand why the spread and the, 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 the response to the disease has, has been largely inadequate for particular population groups, and why income inequality has been crucial in explaining this. Um, it will also look at kind of the, um, the, 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 the depravities between countries around the world. So it will take a very much a global approach as well as kind of within country. Um, and finally, it will also look at kind of looking forward what will be the long-term impact of COVID, but I think more importantly, the um, exasperation of existing inequality. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce the panelists and we'll get on to the panel and what you've all been waiting for. Um, given that this is such a kind of multidisciplinary multidisciplinary topic and inequality in itself is very uh, multidimensional, we have an array of panelists to, to cater for that. So we have Zubeda Hack, who's the kind of former interim director of the Running Me Trust itself, a, a race equality think tank. And now she's been sitting as the um, one of the independent advisors on SAGE. So an invaluable perspective. We also have Marunisha Suleiman, who is currently leading the COVID impact inquiry for the Health Foundation and has been working on how health inequality has uh, kind of manifested in the UK health system in terms of mortality and deprivation. We also have Alfredo Sardfilo, who um, is the head of Department of International Development here at KCL. He was also a professor at SOAS and has written extensively on neoliberalism and kind of the exclusionary role of capitalism. And more recently, how COVID has been exasperating that. And finally, uh, Guy Standing is our last panelist. He is professor at SOAS and uh, published amongst many other books, uh, the, a book called uh, The Precaria, which talks about how particular population groups are vulnerable to precarity, to po poverty, and that has dangerous ramifications for democracy. And then finally, without forgetting Paul Siegel, who is also a senior lecturer here at King's. He's also a member of the LSC Inequalities Trust and um, works um, a lot on glo the global income distribution curve with a specific focus on the top 1%. So uh, an invaluable moderator and will offer crucial expertise. Um, the way this, for this panel will go is each panelist will talk for eight to 10 minutes uh, with, uh, I think Mary Nisha has some slides uh, and then we'll open it up to Q and A. So I would really encourage you all to submit your questions, engage in conversation, comment on what you agree with, what you disagree with. And if you'd like to join the panel and ask your question out loud, please do say so. And I will promote you to a panelist for a few minutes. 
Um, I think we're going to begin with Mary Nisha because she has a few slides uh, and we'll, uh, we'll crack on with the panel. Again, apologies about that delay at the beginning. Typical. Um, okay, Mary Nisha, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Esme, and uh, good evening, everyone. It is uh, a wonderful privilege to be joining you and to be with such an uh, auspicious panel. Um, I am just going to double check that you can see my slides. Can you see my slides? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so what I'll do is spend a few minutes telling you about some of the work that I've been doing at the Health Foundation. Esme, do cut me off at a solid 10 minutes. I can talk about this work endlessly, as my colleagues, friends and family will tell you. As we all know, the pandemic has had, um, has, has captured all, all of our um, uh, conscious and, and unconscious selves. And what the Health Foundation did um, towards the, the summer of last year was, was launch the COVID impact inquiry that we officially began in October of last year to very much look at the evidence um, reflecting the impact of the pandemic on health and health inequalities. And, and the way we've been looking at the evidence is in terms of three timestamps. What was the pre-pandemic picture and organization of society? How were people's health, social and economic assets distributed? What happened when the pandemic hit? Whose assets were further eroded? Um, what new inequalities have emerged because of the pandemic? Um, and, and, and this is not just in terms of the direct impact of the virus itself, but also responses to the virus. Governments across the world have had to take unprecedented measures to restrict the spread of the virus, save lives and prevent spread. But what that has subsequently done is that it has impacted people's um, financial situations in terms of jobs, um, family incomes, and that has further eroded um, people's opportunities for good, for good health and has exacerbated vulnerabilities. And, and I'll illustrate some of these points with, with the data that, that we have collected. I'm not sure my slides are going to move. Oh, there we go. So in terms of the pre-pandemic organization of society, many of you will be familiar with some of the fantastic work that um, Sir Michael Marmot has done in, um, in exploring um, health equity uh, in, in the UK. And the Marmot 10 Years On report that was published by the Health Foundation um, prior to um, lockdown last year showed this um, stalling in life expectancy uh, across England and Wales. And, and why this is important is that it, it displays um, a reduction in opportunities for, for good health. And I'll, I'll, I'll come on to why, why that's of consequence during, during the pandemic. But what we see is that these opportunities for good health reflected in life expectancy and healthy life expectancy follows a very stark social gradient. We see almost a, a 20 year difference um, in, in life expectancy, uh, female healthy life expectancy um, from, from the most deprived to, to least deprived parts of the country. And, and this is crucially important when we think about how um, mortality, hospitalizations, intensive care admissions within the pandemic track um, this, this social gradient. And it means that some of what has happened during the pandemic could have been foreseen. And it means that um, as we um, think about the management of um, ensuing variants and, and the um, different phases of, of the pandemic, we really need to think about the groups that have been disproportionately affected. In terms of some of the, the social and economic factors, we see that um, there was a trend um, in terms of um, poverty in, in the UK. And, and although um, it, you know, employment rates have been um, have been improving. The quality of jobs um, has been has been poor. And and what we also see is that um, a significant proportion of of people um, have been um, on on low incomes, but also a, a significant number of families have had 
um, very low levels of savings. And, and, and this has impacted people's resilience, you know, their ability to absorb the, the, the subsequent financial shock of, of the, the, the pandemic. So, so that gives you a flavor of, of the pre-pandemic organization of society. What's been the impact of the pandemic on, on this? The first is, you know, something that we all very visibly recognize, this difference in mortality that was observed in the first wave of, of the pandemic with the UK faring significantly worse compared to similar and neighboring countries. And, and what we've seen is that subsequent waves have illustrated differences in, in policies um, internationally, but that some research shows that one of the key determinants of mortality in the first wave was when was um, about when countries locked down. Uh, in, in fact, um, the, the date of lockdown in some studies accounts for 40% of uh, the subsequent mortality in, in wave one. And, and this shows, you know, sort of the, the importance, but also the, the underlying variation that was observed. Why is um, healthy life expectancy important? Uh, this um, chart shows that countries that have had greatest improvements in healthy life expectancy in the last decade um, experienced lower excess mortality during the pandemic. And, and what this means is that when countries um, are afforded um, opportunities for good health, it, it means that there is a greater resilience against shocks like um, the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that the prevalence of diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, not only makes your immune system more vulnerable to, to the virus, but that subsequently your outcomes are, are also much worse. And, and it means that countries really do need to spend on improving population health and also sustaining population health this also shows the um, impacts of income inequality and excess mortality, the Gini coefficient showing that countries that have higher levels of inequality have seen higher rates of mortality. It means that um, unequal societies are less resilient societies to um, a, 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 an external variable like um, the, 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 the COVID-19 um, virus. When we think about the disproportionate impacts of the virus, we see how it tracks that um, deprivation social gradient. Um, and that um, although we see that non-COVID mortality was higher in more deprived areas, we see that COVID mortality has a steeper gradient. And that means that there are significant factors such as people's jobs, their housing, their access to support and services that have been crucial in um, determining both exposure and subsequently outcomes to the virus. And, and, and this is a graphic illustrating some of um, the, 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 the outcomes from the first wave that people from ethnic minority communities, disabled people um, have fared significantly worse. We know that this has tracked through um, into the wave, wave two of the pandemic. Um, and, and one of um, the really stark statistics that has stayed with me throughout the pandemic is one in six um, uh, deaths from, from the pandemic have, has been um, uh, amongst those um, with, with disabilities. What has been the impact of responses to the virus? Um, we know that people have faced more financial precarity in the UK. This is illustrated in um, the need for um, universal credit. And this is particularly true for those on lower incomes, but um, and, and this is illustrated in, in the blue, blue circle, but also that there, there are new um, uh, vulnerabilities emerging that those even from um, the least deprived areas are also accessing universal credit. And it means that people who previously weren't vulnerable have been made vulnerable because of the pandemic. The other key issue is what's happening to family finances. And we see that lower income households have um, had to carry a greater burden, spending their savings and also facing um, greater amount, amounts of debt compared to those um, from more wealthier households. And, and finally, um, this is really crucially important, you know, this link between um, people's economic circumstances and subsequently their, their health outcomes. And, and what, we, what we see is that those who've experienced persistently lower pay during the pandemic 
are more likely to report poorer well-being. And this tracks through across all metrics of, of mental health. And this is incredibly concerning when we think about the ensuing burden of, of mental health, not just in the UK, but globally. Um, although there has been a bounce back once restrictions have been lifted, there, there is a significant proportion of the population that are experiencing erosions in, in their mental health that will um, be crucially important um, for, the, for the longer term. Esme, I'll, I'll stop here. Absolutely, no, thank you so much, Mary Lisa. that's fascinating. I mean, just fundamentally, the unequal societies are less resilient, it's just true across the world. And I think actually the fact that people who weren't previously vulnerable that are now vulnerable leads us nicely into Professor Guy Standing's um, work who has, has, has researched a lot around this. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to give a, a different uh, perspective. I suspect that Alfredo will be talking about some of the things I'm going to briefly discuss. I think everything we're experiencing during the COVID pandemic and we're going to be experiencing over the next few years is ultimately related to the economic model that has been built up in the last uh, 50 years. And it began with neoliberalism of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, which fundamentally the most important aspect for what subsequently happened was the deregulation of finance. And since then, finance has become an octopus that has completely dominated the global economy. And with the big tech companies and big pharma uh, have created a new model of capitalism, which in the book I just published uh, called The Corruption of Capitalism, I've characterized as rentier capitalism. And the first point I want to make is that we are no longer living in a neoliberal era. The neoliberal policies uh, finished in the late 1990s because they created a structure which has turned the global economy into the most unfree market economy that's ever existed. I mean, that is a, a strong point I want to begin with. And the, the development of rentier capitalism extended from the incredible power of finance, which has gone from being a servant of economic activity to being totally dominant. In the United Kingdom, for example, the market value of financial assets, of financial institutions, has risen to over 1,000% of GDP, of national income. In the United States, it's over 500%. In many other countries, it's also over 500%. And finance, in fact, has been taking more and more of the total income. But rentier capitalism has meant that more and more of total income has gone to the owners of property, financial property, physical property, and fundamentally, intellect, so-called intellectual property. And the big change was epitomized by the passage of the, in the World Trade Organization in 1994 of TRIPS, trade-related aspects of intellectual property. And what this essentially did, and it was guided by the US corporations and US administration backed by Britain and a number of other rich countries, it globalized the US intellectual property rights regime. What this means is that it actually, contrary to all the statements of neoliberalism, it created monopolization so that any corporation that could patent something, a procedure or a product, uh, would have automatic monopoly profits because nobody else is allowed to produce it for 20 years. And in the case of pharmaceuticals, it could be through various procedures, it can be extended to 40 years. And we've gone to a point where 
1994, there were fewer than 1 million patents in the world filed with, with, the, with WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. And then by the early part of this century, it had risen to over 3 million each year. And there are over 15 million patents in force at the moment. And what this does is it channels huge rental income to the major corporations because they have become patent hoovers. They go around and they put huge numbers of patents together, string them together, and can earn billions. Far too little attention has been given to this aspect of the global capitalist system. And of course, we've seen it in the case of the COVID vaccines with this demand for, for waivers and so on. But I, I don't believe that they will allow that because that would be the thin wedge, a desirable thin end of a wedge, because the whole system relies on capturing the rental incomes. In addition, countries have moved to a new form of mercantilism where they back their big national champion corporations with huge subsidies, huge tax cuts, huge lobbying capacity, and use the international financial institutions to further their encroachment uh, in developing countries. So we've had a huge shift from development aid, which was grants mainly, but then increasingly with conditions, to loans which have tied to allowing access to their big national champions or some other incursion into their economies. So we have a situation where rentier capitalism has been spreading and the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, was a shock a crisis waiting to happen. If one compares the Spanish flu 100 years ago with this pandemic, many more people probably died at that in that Spanish flu, but the economic crisis was not as great. And the fundamental reason is that the global economy in 2019 was incredibly fragile, incredibly fragile, where in which huge national debts, particularly in developing countries, public debts, were also matched with huge corporate debts because companies had loaded themselves with debt and had been distributing their profits instead of investing for growth, if you want growth, I don't necessarily do, but instead of doing that, giving to their shareholders or themselves and loading their companies with debt. So huge global crisis of corporate debt. So we now will have a rumbling in the post pandemic period of a lot of bankruptcies. But in addition, you have huge private debt. Household debt around the world is at unprecedented levels. And this links to the thesis that I've been advancing in my books and, and articles, which is a new global class structure has been taking shape in the context of rentier capitalism. The plutocrats, we all know about them, the plutocrats, are earning mostly rental incomes from property, from wealth. That's why they did so fantastically well uh, last year. In addition, the elite underneath them have been gaining rent. So have the salaried people. People in, in, with salaried employment, with pensions and everything, have done very well out of this pandemic. So it's wrong, I think, to say that only the top 1% or 0.1% have been actually gaining. They, the rentiers go quite long, far down in the system. It's the precariat, the growing mass class of people who are being exploited by rental mechanisms through debt. Finance loves debt. Finance wants people to be in debt. That's how they make their money. And people in the precariat are now going to be tumbling into homelessness, tumbling into suicidal situations, tumbling into incredible insecurity. It's a surge that's going to be happening. And so what we've had is a triple K in the terms of the distribution of income. Before the pandemic struck, the rentiers were gaining, the 
people relying on labor were falling uh, further and further behind. During the pandemic, there's another K. The people at the top and the salariat have done extremely well. The people in the precariat, which is growing and mushrooming, have been doing extremely badly. And then this will take place even more so when the stimulus packages are wound down, if that is what happens. Now, this talk, as I understood it, was about conflict as well as development. And what we've seen with rentier capitalism is that China was rather left out of what was happening before 2001, because China was not a member of the World Trade Organization. But when it joined, it started to become a rentier economy itself. And by 2011, it was filing more patents than the United States, which was the second biggest in the world. And by 2015, it was filing more patents than the US, Japan, the European Union, and South Korea combined. So we have the situation where China has become a new dominant rentier economy. And if you go to places in Africa, and I work a lot in Africa these days, you see the Chinese system there and making rentier profits and doing deals with governments so that they can have access to resources and become mercantilist in their own way. And we are going to see a period of incredible tension and conflict in the next decade, because now the Chinese are moving into Antarctica, the Arctic is also being colonized by the various major powers, and the scope for conflict is growing and growing. And the points I want to mention by means of concluding is that we need to realize that we will only build resilience, particularly in developing countries, if we learn one fundamental lesson from the last year. The resilience of all of us depends on the resilience of the weakest and most vulnerable among us. And that is one reason why I've been advocating a basic income, both as a development tool and as an essential vital part of the recovery in countries like Britain and the US and elsewhere, because then we would give a base for people to have basic security. Without basic security, we cannot be resilient. We cannot be robust and have an immunity. And all the stresses and the morbidity that's just been mentioned will become much greater if people don't have basic security. And the universal credit is a fraud. We know that huge numbers of people are, put, are, are punished and, and sanctioned and don't get it. It's been the, the varieties of means-tested benefits have been allowed to fall. We need a new income distribution system in dismantling rentier capital. And that, I think, is the context in which anybody who's a developmental st a student doing development studies or anybody doing social policy should confront this particular crisis, because it is a transformational crisis that may well lead to a new dark period of neo-fascist populism. We got away with Trump. He nearly succeeded. He's still got 74 million votes, even though he's an, an ogre. And we may well see that drift unless we provide the precariat with basic security. And that is the biggest single challenge ahead for all of us. Thank you very much. Guy, thank you so much. That was brilliant and fascinating. Um, I'll now move on uh, to Zobeda, who will, I know Alfredo will compliment Guy nicely and will break up a bit of um, academic with a bit of policy from Zubeda, who. Um, we'll talk a lot about her experience um, with race and inequality and, and minorities. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm honoured to be with such um, amazing academics and people from, um, you know, King's College and the Health Foundation and so on. 
um, it's really fantastic. And I think in, in, in that sense, um, it, it's great that I was invited because hopefully I can bring a completely different perspective um, to this, but complementary. So I thought rather than giving a sort of um, a, a more academic talk that I would I would talk I would try and tie together what Maranish has been saying and what Guy's been saying about how this pandemic has been everything but the great leveler um, and of course that's what we heard at the beginning that this was the great leveler because the virus doesn't discriminate but of course what we've seen not just in the UK but throughout the world is um, the virus may not discriminate, but we're not in the same boat. We're, we're, we're facing the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And, and that became really clear. So I thought I'd start off with really, I'm going to talk to you about my work and, and I suppose just sort of bring to light um, what we've heard from Guy and Maranisha about how this pandemic has been um, impacting on different groups in very disproportionate ways. Now, as um, Esme mentioned, I, um, a year ago, I was the um, interim director of the Runnemy Trust, which is a race equality think tank. So actually, it was more than a year ago, back in March last year, um, I found myself in a situation where, of course, you know, the pandemic, we'd just been hit by the pandemic. It was like watching the slow car crash as the government tried to get itself together. Of course, it took them a while. Um, but I quickly realised from a Runnymede perspective, that this pandemic was going to hit black and minority groups very hard. And that's exactly because, as Maranisha Mer mentioned, that we were always aware of the pre-existing inequalities among black and ethnic minority groups in this country. And those pre-existing inequalities were both in terms of class, but also in terms of race. So for instance, we knew that on average black and ethnic minority groups were two times more likely to be in poverty, were much more likely to be in overcrowded housing, depending on which ethnic group you looked at. Bangladeshis and Pakistanis are about, you know, like one in four are much more likely to be in overcrowded housing, but around 15% of black African groups are likely to be in overcrowded housing. We also knew that different ethnic groups were more likely to be in multi-generational housing um, and that there were high rates of poverty, and of course, that a large proportion of black and ethnic minority groups were in low paid, precarious work. Guy, a professor standing, talked quite a lot about the low paid, precarious work. And Maranisha talked about that in terms of universal credit and so on. And all of that was important because we knew immediately that when the pandemic hit, that it would not be evenly spread. As I mentioned, people would not be in the same boat. Um, so straight away, you know, um, as working and um, working at Runnymede, we quickly pulled ourselves together and thought, right, the first thing we need to do is make sure that the government are going to take this into consideration, make sure that the public understands what's going on. So we started writing blog pieces, started talking to the media and so on, and really trying to make them understand why it is that we thought black and ethnic minority groups would be disproportionately. And of course, it was about amplifying not only the pre-existing inequalities, but also explaining why those groups would be hit hard. Um, now, just to speed, for, um, just to speed forward, uh, a couple of months later, I thought the best way to make the public understand how black and ethnic minority groups were hit and to split the ethnic minority groups up, how they were hit by the pandemic, as Esme said, not just in health, not just in health terms, but also in social and economic terms, is I did that by um, commissioning a national survey. So last summer, um, as, as the interim director of Runnymede Trust, I commissioned a national survey with an ethnic minority boost to look at how the pandemic was hitting different groups. And lo and behold, what we found was what all the academic research was showing, but what government was blind to. And that was the fact that the reason black and ethnic minority groups, black and Asian particularly, were being hit hard was because they were much more likely to be in low paid front facing jobs. They were much more likely to be the health and social care workers, if you recall, rather tragically, um, 
you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we found that um, more than half, around 60 out of 100 NHS workers who died were from Black and ethnic minority groups. So they're much more likely to be on the front line, but actually they're much more likely to be among the low paid ones as well. The healthcare assistants, the social care workers, the, um, the, the delivery drivers, the, um, the, the cleaners, but all of that was front facing and on the front line. And that meant that they were much more likely to be exposed but they were also much more likely to bring it home. And that meant that um, they were likely to spread it because of the conditions that on average black and Asian groups lived in, which was overcrowded housing, living in urban areas, living in multi-generational um, living in multi-generational homes, all of which meant that social distancing was not possible. Um, and of course, public transport, they are much more likely to tra travel on travel public transport. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this is because it amplifies or it explains why black and ethnic minority groups, not just in this country, but also in the US with black groups, but also across the world, have been much more exposed to this virus, have been much more likely to be severely ill from this virus, partly because, as, as, um, as, as Maranisha mentioned, because of pre-existing health inequalities and comorbidities. So we're much more likely to be severely ill, but, much, but we're also much more likely to die from this virus. Now, I'm going to stop there in terms of my Runnymede work, but now I'm going to talk to you about how in my work on Independent Sage, and you could look us up, um, www.independentsage.org, um, I work with 12 other scientists. Um, the reason I was brought on board was because a lot, we realised a lot of our work would be around, would be on inequality. We realised that much of Sage's work was looking at the health aspects of this pandemic but not really at the social and economic aspects of this pandemic. And that had already become clear to me because just jumping back to my run and read work, we didn't work alone. We quickly started to work with poverty organizations and with, um, um, with poverty organizations, migration organizations, and with the women's sector. We all had to collaborate together because we realized that it wasn't just in terms of black and ethnic minority characteristics that people would be disproportionately hit by this pandemic, not necessarily in terms of health-wise, in terms of mortality, but in terms of the social and economic and psychological um, um, aspects or, or manifestations of the pandemic. So I worked very closely with the Forces Society, with the Women's Budget Group, and we commissioned research together and found that women were not only much more likely to lose jobs, when were not only more likely to be furloughed, but they were much more likely to have to take on a disproportionate amount of the childcare. And it wasn't the fun bits of childcare, it was the harder bits. Esme, am I running out of time? Am I okay? I've got a couple of, two minutes left. Two minutes left, sorry. So, and, and similarly, working with the third sector of poverty organisations, the reason we were collaborating is because as Maranisha mentioned, and as Guy mentioned, we found straight away that those in low paid work were less likely to be furloughed and much more likely to lose their jobs, which meant that they were, you know, that they then had to rely on other income and not everybody realized that they could rely on, um, that they could apply for universal credit, all of which were coming out in all of our surveys. Um, and we used that information to, bring to the public, to bring to the government, but we particularly utilise that information in relation to government policy. Because one of the things we haven't talked a lot about is how government policy, how they reacted to this pandemic, has also exacerbated the inequalities in this country, and I'm sure in other countries as well. And that includes the vaccination rollout as well, because what we realised is in all of the policies, the government were not carrying out impact assessments, equality impact assessments, to see how their policies were impacting on different groups. And that's really, really crucial. Um, 
And I can explain more about that perhaps in questions, but that was very important. Now, in terms of the independent sage work that we did, a lot of our work was about that. A lot of our work was around saying to the government, there is no point in testing as, and, and you know that government were trying to roll out mass testing as they are now with lateral flow tests. There is no point in testing unless you financially support self-isolation. Because what we found was that people were not coming forward for testing because they couldn't afford to self-isolate. Similarly, when we were talking about policies, we realized the government wasn't taking into consideration women's circumstances, weren't doing very much around domestic violence and domestic abuse, which increased, um, and so on. Now, I'll stop there because, sorry, it, it, I hadn't meant to sort of go into that long story, but I guess what I was trying to bring to light was was really how all of these issues were really brought to the fore. Actually, one last thing I'm going to mention are vaccine, vaccine rollout, because that's the other thing, of course, that we covered on Independent Sage, because we realised with vaccine rollout, it wasn't straightforward, and there was a lot of vaccine inequality. And um, people in, in deprived areas and among Black and Asian groups, so all the groups that were much more exposed to this virus were much more at risk from this virus were also less likely to take up vaccination. So we've done a lot of work around that. And for all of these things, we wrote lots of reports, but more than that, we've taken it to the media, we've taken it to the government, and we've tried to sort of influence policy in that way. Thank you very much, Esme. Veda, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And I think, you know, you're so right. You have to ask why these impact assessments weren't conducted and what what the, the kind of underlying motivations of that are. Um, and now finally, we'll move on to Alfredo before Paul Siegel will take over the Q&A moderation. Um, Alfredo, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much. This is an absolutely brilliant uh, panel. I will uh, speak about a book that I have just finished uh, around this topic. And what the book does is to look at the pandemic from a political economy perspective uh, in the context of the system of accumulation today or the current phase of capitalism, which is, um, of course, neoliberalism. And one way to look at the pandemic is by pointing out that uh, COVID-19 has highlighted some very important limitations of neoliberalism, uh, and um, they are likely to lead to a drift into fascism, but also with uh, strong movements of resistance uh, emerging at the same time. The outcome of that uh, is, of course, open. So I want to argue that the pandemic belongs in a context of the uh, economic crisis of neoliberalism and the political crises of neoliberal uh, democracies. And this is why uh, to cut a long story short, why, in my view, countries that followed more strongly neoliberal policies since the great financial crisis that started in 2007, uh, policies like fiscal austerity and the dismantling of the state, those countries also tended to have more uh, authoritarian neoliberal leaders later, and they tended to do worse in the pandemic uh, as well. And the analysis will then start from the point that we live in the age of neoliberalism and the most important uh, feature of neoliberalism is financialization, meaning the subordination of social and economic reproduction to the accumulation of what Marx called interest bearing capital, that's, that's finance. Um, and the core of financialization is the transfer of control of the allocation of resources from Keynesian states, from developmental states, to a globally integrated financial system. And this is what allows finance to control the most important sources of capital and the most important levers of economic policy in most countries today. This is what neoliberalism is about. The next consequence or implication of or feature of neoliberalism is the transnationalization of production and finance. That's what is commonly called globalization. And this is about the international integration of the circuits of accumulation at the level of individual firms. Correlated with that, the liberalization of trade, domestic finance, and international capital flows to allow this model to work. And then next is the state, neoliberalism, 
despite the discourse, is not about the withdrawal of the state, not about the rollback of the state. Uh, the role of the neoliberal state is to impose and to legitimize neoliberalism. It's to transfer to finance control over the sources of capital. It is to impose a new legal framework to put together uh, the new industrial structure, the new uh, financial structure. It is to privatize public assets. It is to repress the opposition. And in the last four decades, neoliberalism has transformed the economies and societies and public policies, and it created unprecedentedly favorable conditions for accumulation. The West won the Cold War, we have seen the, 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 the liberalization of trade and finance and capital movements. We have seen unparalleled support to accumulation by competing states. We saw cuts in taxes and transfers in welfare provision. Uh, as my colleagues have pointed out, we have seen the decline of the traditional sources of uh, resistance in the nationalist movements, nationalist governments, trade unions, peasant movements, left-wing political parties. We've seen the ideological hegemony of neoliberalism. And with this came a tremendous recovery of uh, profit rates since the lows of the 1970s. But, and this is shocking, instead of thriving, GDP growth and investment, at least in the core countries, have been slowing down. And between 2007 and 2020, the West suffered the deepest and the longest economic crisis and the weakest and the most regressive economic recovery on record. This is what I call the economic paradox of neoliberalism. You create extraordinarily favorable conditions for accumulation and you have a complete inability to capitalize on them. Following from this, we have the political paradox of neoliberalism, the, the consolidation of neoliberal democracies in the uh, 1980s and 1990s undermined the institutions of representation and the capacity of states to resolve social conflicts. And in circumstances, as we saw, of continuing economic crises and permanent fiscal austerity, this fed a crisis of democracy. And this leads to the third paradox that will underpin my analysis of the pandemic, which is a paradox of authoritarianism. We have the economic crisis in neoliberalism, we have a political crisis in uh, democracy. This led to authoritarianism and the personalization of politics and the emergence of what I call spectacular authoritarian um, right-wing political leaders. And this process became evident with the election of Narendra Modi in 2014, then the Brexit vote and the election of Donald Trump in 2016, the election of Jair Bolsonaro in 2018, and it was similar in many other countries uh, too. The problem is that the neoliberal policies that these authoritarian leaders pursue, they damage and they undermine their own base of support and they open space for new forms of fascism. So we have this rolling uh, economic and political crises uh, taking place when the pandemic uh, hits uh, in early uh, 2020. And what we saw was that the most uncompromising neoliberal uh, countries could not mount a coherent response to the pandemic, even though there were successful examples to follow, examples of China, of Kerala state, of New Zealand, Senegal, Singapore, Taiwan, and so on. And what the authoritarian neoliberal governments tended to do instead was to veer towards policies of what became known as herd immunity whatever the cost uh, in terms of lives lost. And what they ended up doing was having the highest um, death rates. They have the highest cost in terms of uh, economic damage as well. And they ended up perpetuating the uh, pandemic and making it impossible effectively to eliminate the coronavirus. That was a dramatic policy failure of those neoliberal administration. And the uh, administrations. And the implication is that the crisis of public health and the crisis of the economy that we have today were caused by political choices. They were not caused by a virus. They were caused by political choices. They were caused by the dismantling of state capacities. They were caused by failures of implementation. They were caused by a shocking misunderstanding of the nature of the pandemic. So my general conclusion is that today neoliberalism sustains itself primarily through coercion. And this is not just about overt um, repression, but we see plenty of that, 
It's also about austerity policies in the economic domain, backed up by punishing measures against the poor, against the underprivileged, against uh, the neglected. Uh, and it is also based on the escalation of all forms of repression against dissent, for example, through electronic uh, monitoring. Now, in those circumstances, we have a stagnation of neoliberalism, we have a degeneration of democracy, we have to confront that through the broadest possible political alliances. And it is only possible, um, I suggest, it's only possible to build alternatives to neoliberalism if we integrate economic and political demands into a positive program for the expansion of political democracy and the expansion of economic democracy. So in that sense, the pandemic is an indictment of neoliberalism, but it is also a rehearsal for a much bigger challenge that we have, uh, which is the challenge of uh, climate change and the environmental disaster uh, that is unfolding around us. And the pandemic also uh, shows uh, to me that the impasses on the economy, politics, and in health, they cannot be addressed through a renewal of neoliberalism. They cannot be addressed through commitments to a mythical uh, free market or through a reversal to fiscal austerity. Even the attempt to do any of this will undermine democracy. So the pandemic can uh, open spaces for progressive form of political activity. If we have mobilizations organized around concerns with um, equality, with collectivity, with economic and political democracy, and this is what uh, I think we should focus uh, right now. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Alfredo. I think I have lots of questions personally, but I better pass over to Paul, who will lead the Q&A. And if there's time, I'll, 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 I'll jump in. But um, Paul, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, uh, extremely interesting set of discussions on, on the impact of COVID and the relationship between COVID and inequality nationally and globally. And it seems to me one of the big puzzles that's kind of been touched upon, but uh, I don't feel like we have an answer to, and, it, and I'd really like to hear what the panelists have to say about this, so if we could perhaps start the discussion on, on this topic. I'm very curious about the political impact of uh, COVID and the, the effect it's had on the, um, the governments around the world that have been attempting to address it. <clears throat> uh, I mean, one might think that a major health crisis like this that clearly needs a huge amount of investment in public health would lead to an unequivocal rise in support for uh, public services. And you'd expect that to help a certain type of government and, and not help other types of governments. In particular, we've heard a lot about neoliberalism and we might expect it would imply a turn against neoliberalism. But in this country, uh, and we've heard quite a lot about the relationship between COVID and inequality in this country, in this country, it seems to have led to support for a conservative government that has been pretty clearly in favor of austerity and a decline in um, spending on public services. And just recently, there was an extremely, you know, they, they, they were proposing a below inflation pay rise for health workers. <clears throat> uh, if you think of another country, Argentina, um, which is a country I happen to know quite well, so I've been watching what's been going on there. They have a relatively left-wing government in power, Peronist government, they call it. And there, the right-wing opposition uh, very strongly took the, if you like, the, the Trump stance, um, the Donald Trump view, which was that any constraint on, on people's movement and freedom and, and actions was a violation of their rights. Uh, and they seem to have made a certain amount of, of, had a certain amount of political success from doing that. At least it's, um, uh, I mean, they haven't won any elections yet, but that's the line they've been taking. And so I'd be very interested if the panelists might give some comments on where we see this going forwards. Um, I mean, it's already been mentioned, so we've, had, we've had two presentations on the UK where we, where we know quite well what the government's done and also this slightly paradoxical political reaction to it. But we've also heard two speakers talking about the international situation um, and we've had references to the, you know, the possibility of the rise of fascism. So I'd be very interested to hear what the panelists have to say, and perhaps then we can we can open up to a wider discussion 
on, on kind of where this can go politically, what, how this is, what, what the political impact of this is going to be, because it, presumably the political side is going to be what determines um, what happened, you know, how, how, this, uh, how this develops, how the question of both, you know, health policy and neoliberalism uh, develop in the future. So if anyone would like to, to remark on, on, on that issue, that'd be great. And then perhaps I can open up to wider questions. Esme, I'd be happy to kick off. That'd be great. Um, Paul, uh, fantastic question. And I can, I can begin the conversation just in terms of some of the work that we've done at the Health Foundation, trying to capture public opinion on some of these issues around um, uh, the, the, the public's view on um, the pandemic, uh, the impact of the pandemic on inequalities and the appetite for government action on, on these. And from the work that we've done, I can say that there is a greater recognition of um, the, 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 the differential impacts of the pandemic, but also the role of the wider determinants of health, this greater recognition that jobs, housing, um, incomes are crucial for good health and that there is um, a, a, an appetite for action on these, on these aspects. Um, and, and so what it means for the, for the UK in particular is it's an unprecedented time for there being um, a, a recognition for government action on recovery. But the, 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 the point to add is, you know, when we're, when we're talking about um, political change and political action, maybe one of the things that the pandemic has also highlighted is what we mean in terms of that level, the level of political action we're referring to and the role of local government, but also the role of devolved governments in the UK has also become um, more, more recognised. And there is a, a, a huge push towards more of that, that localised action and, and, and localised coordination that the pandemic may well be um, a, a, a point of, of change on. I mean, since we're talking about the UK, maybe Zubeda, if you have a, uh, any thoughts on, on this country's reaction. A, a lot of thoughts. I'm not sure if it's all publicly uh, wise to share. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, th I think Maranish is right that, um, or, or perhaps she's been quite kind. There's certainly a disparity between where the public is and what the public have learned from this pandemic versus what I would argue, what the government have learned from this pandemic in terms of going forward with the post-COVID recovery. I mean, I would argue that they're, they're not even there yet. It, I, you know, so much of this government's reaction to the pandemic has been ill thought out, has been scrambling, has been a reflection of incompetence, has, has, has really been a lot of as we've heard many a time, dither and delay, that I'm not necessarily entirely convinced that there is a big ideology that's underlying it all, unless you consider the natural herd immunity infection ideology. I think that that was there at the beginning. Um, we on Independence Age and, and many of my, you know, many others and many other scientists out there still believe it hasn't entirely left this government. And that is the most manifest through how they are approaching schools. There are not really any mitigations in schools whatsoever. What few there were, such as face masks, they've taken away. Um, you know, it, if you consider those to be ideologies, they're there. But um, I mean, with this government, it's just so difficult because if you, if you think about how they've handled test and trace, and I know that's a really specific example, but it's fundamental to this pandemic because test and trace was supposed to be the key way that we had control of this pandemic where we you know found found identified people with the virus we traced their contacts we isolated them we we cut we broke the chains of transmission it's supposed to be fundamental now that would have been best if it was locally led because local professionals local public health directors GPs um, and so on, primary carers, they all know their local communities. They know how to find people. They know how to, they have trust by local people and so on. But instead, the government did something which we wouldn't have expected, which is 
be centralized. They had centralized services. So I, I think, to be honest, Paul, I, I'm much more skeptical about the ideologies. I understand, you know, th there's certainly ideologies in terms of the government gave less money to public services, more to private companies. You know, there was much more accumulation of private wealth, uh, much more profit with pri by private individuals and private companies. But um, I, I don't think that th there's been a clear path. I, I'm not sure the government's that competent. Guy, you do you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Oh, you're, you're think, muted. I am unmuted now. Um, I, I think it's, it's important, and I don't want to turn this into an argument, but I think it's important to see the economy and the economic structure today as fundamentally different from what Thatcher and Reagan were proposing and what was meant by neoliberalism back in the 1980s and 1990s. The man who, who gave the, the title to the set of policies of neoliberalism as the Washington Consensus, John Williamson, happened to die earlier this year. And we're a very far cry from the Washington Consensus, and I think that what we haven't discussed so far is the systemic corruption that has become part of the hallmark of the modern rentier state. I think what you can interpret what Boris Johnson and his crew have been doing very much in class terms, very much as an ideological uh, project it's a different project from what Thatcher was pushing. But it's very interesting that if you look at Sunak, he got his apprenticeship working for Goldman Sachs. He did four years working for Goldman Sachs. And then he worked for a man who last year in Britain received, I don't like the word earned, over one million pounds a day, every day of the year he received over one million pounds. Now, here you have a totally different situation from anything remotely cl close to a free market system, which for all her many, many, many faults, that's what Thatcher was pursuing. And we have a structure, a rigged capitalism with revolving doors. And I list the very many people who go from politics into Goldman Sachs and back into JP Morgan and then back into politics and back into the heading the bank centralized central banks or whatever, and then back into to politics. And it's, it's a global phenomenon. And this financial elite is pulling the triggers for property ownership and property incomes. So what you've seen is the functional share of income going to capital and going particularly to forms of rent has been going up in every part of the world, including China, possibly more so in China than in any other country. And the proportion going to people who rely on labor has been going down and down and down. And the growth of the precariat is creating conflictual tensions. And I I thought that Alfredo's points on this were very pertinent because what we've got with a growing class of the precariat is some parts of it with, without too much education are supporting the Trumps and the Boris Johnsons and the Salvinis in Italy where I am at the moment and they are supporting a neo-fascist populism. But the other part of the precariat, what I call the progressive part, the young educated part, they're not going to be fooled into voting for a neo-fascist populism. But there's a lot of energy out there. I receive emails every single day from all over the world, of people saying, I'm part of the precariat and we are going to start taking action. But I think you have to, un you have to articulate a, a system whereby huge subsidies are being given by the state to finance and corporate capital. We're having a dispossession of our commons all over the world. 
particularly in developing countries, and increasingly in the oceans of the world, we're having a dispossession in favor of private equity capital, venture capital, and the big financial institutions like BlackRock and Goldman Sachs. So we, we, I think it's more important to see the tensions that this is producing, because at the top of the pile of tensions will be between the declining United States and a rising China. And China is becoming a very uh, avuncular rentier economy. Huge rent, it's not a neoliberal economy, it's a rent-seeking economy. And it's doing extremely well around the world. The new Silk Road is merely a metaphor for what is was happening. And of course, the United States is a shrinking rentier economy and lashing out and will be increasingly violent and increasingly likely to vote for another Trump unless something fundamental changes in our distribution system and we get a new progressive agenda. We are at a very vital point, and I fully agree with Alfredo, we are at a transformational crisis point. And this pandemic has merely accelerated what, and you're going to see uh, the huge number of zombie firms in Britain that have just been propped up by this stupid furlough scheme, which is extremely regressive. And once this is unwound, you will see bankruptcies galore, and a whole lot of people will be tipped out into the lumpen precariat, if you like. And I think that this is a, a, a point where it's much, it's much more important to focus on structures and systems of accumulation and disaccumulation, but not put, put everything into the basket of neoliberalism. Alfredo, would you like to follow up? Um, destructive, again, at the level of society, uh, it is destructive at the level of society, and it is profoundly counterproductive when you have a social phenomenon like a pandemic that requires coordinated responses and requires people to, be, to behave in specific ways that have internal coherence to contain the spread of the virus. Now, um, Neoliberalism dismantled collectivity, dismantled collectivity in practice. It dismantled uh, workplaces. It dismantled uh, production systems that existed with some coherence within uh, nations. It interna internationalized them and restricted or reduced the ways in which people connected in their workplaces, in their communities, in their clubs, uh, according to their uh, political preferences, uh, etc. Neoliberalism dismantled the mechanisms of political representation and economic representation of the collectives. They dismantled the large political parties, dismantled trade unions, dismantled uh, all sorts of uh, organizations that existed in the past at grassroots uh, level. This disables political action to a very large extent by the least powerful people in society. And what we have seen happening, maybe it didn't have to be this way, but this is what happened is the projection of agency into political leaders that seem to be coming from outside of the political system, Donald Trump, Jair Bolsonaro, uh, or even Boris Johnson, some kind of eccentric uh, personality that is, that is his own uh, person. But you project agency onto those uh, leaders. And since as a collective or as an individual, you have no power, you expect them to resolve problems for you. But this is profoundly, self-destructive because these political leaders are not outsiders. They are deeply committed to a very perverse form, an authoritarian form, a reactionary form of neoliberalism, and the implementation of their policies worsens the situation for their own voters. So my suggestion that I tried to articulate before is that authoritarian neoliberalism is unsustainable, is, is, is intrinsically unstable, and it tends to drift into authority, increasing levels of authoritarianism, and it tends to fertilize the terrain for the emergence of new forms of fascism. These authoritarian leaders cannot resolve problems. And this, the, the pandemic is just one symptom, but there are other instances as well. that They cannot resolve problems. What they do is instead of resolving problems, they create conflict. They live 
politically by creating uh, dissent, by creating enemies, by promoting enemies, by confronting them. And this is instead of addressing the problems, the actual problems of the people who voted for them. So I'm pessimistic in that sense that neoliberalism can lead to the emergence of solutions from within itself. And the pandemic is one drastic, dramatic, terrible uh, example, but there are others uh, too. But I am hopeful that the, uh, this, the, the magnitude of the shock will lead to mobilization. And in this sense, the United States offers a positive example uh, of uh, mobilizations that have been able to shift um, economic policy at the uh, federal level, and hopefully will continue to do this. And hopefully that example will serve to inform political action in other countries too. We need more of that, much more uh, than that, but we are now in a much better situation than we were when Trump was still uh, in power. So hopefully something will move in this country as well and in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alfredo. And it's a rather troubling thought, but it seems, I mean, who can know uh, the counterfactual, but it seems plausible that Trump might actually have won again if it hadn't been for the COVID pandemic uh, because he handled it so spectacularly badly. Um, so, you know, we should be thankful for small mercies, I suppose. Um, so moving to uh, some questions from the audience, if I can just click on the Q&A up here. So Emma Sandvig Ling asks, uh, well, she notes, or, uh, inequalities have increased during the pandemic. Will we go back to normal after the pandemic? Or will inequalities continue to increase? And what can we do to mitigate the inequalities brought on by the pandemic? So, you know, what, 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 what can we, are we going to return to some kind of normality? To some extent, we've, we've, we've been talking about this in terms of politics and the over, and sort of the big questions, but um, uh, what can we do to mitigate the inequalities uh, going forwards if we, if we can find governments willing to implement the policies? Um, Guy, please go ahead. Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, I've argued in a book that we've got this triple K uh, development. I don't think it will the gains are only at the very top. Um, quite a lot of people in the salariat uh, have done very well out of the pandemic and were doing very well beforehand. They get a lot of rentier incomes. The precariat are, are exploited by rentier incomes. And the reality in Britain is this, that income inequality has been growing steadily over the last 50 years, despite some people claiming otherwise. Uh, it, the chief economist on the Financial Times, Giles, he denies it. But, but many sources of data show that income inequality has been steadily growing. And one of the phenomenon in Britain is that the extent of hiding incomes in tax havens is higher than any, any other country with known data. Something like 20% of wealth in the country is actually channeled into tax havens and therefore not recorded in our national statistics. But the biggest, the biggest story for people thinking about these things is this. While income inequality has grown and the Gini coefficient has grown, wealth inequality is much greater than income inequality. And the value of wealth in Britain, private wealth, has grown from 300% of GDP back in the 1980s to over 700% today. So the, store, the main story of the growth of inequality is the growth of wealth relative to income. Because the Gini coefficient, the standard measure of inequality of wealth, is much, much greater than the Gini of income. And if you increase the, the wealth relative to income and the wealth inequality is already much greater systematically, then of course you're getting far greater uh, wealth inequality. And it's written, risen to the extent where over 60% of the wealth, private wealth, private riches in Britain are inherited, not earned. It's a complete lie that, that somehow wealth is earned by hard work and entrepreneurial abilities. It, that's a bullshit statement. 
what we're really seeing is a growth of inherited wealth. And this is, this is rentier capitalism writ large. It has nothing to do with the nature of the market. It is a system of uh, private property rights triumphing over any market principles. So you get huge monopolies, but you also get huge wealth. And of course, the wealth feeds into the political domination through funding the Conservative Party, through incredible chumocracy deals that we've seen in the past year, where they're given government billions have been given without any sort of tendering or anything like that. And we, we're seeing a systematic plunder of the economy for the rentiers. And this has nothing to do with the market. It has purely to do with corruption and the existence of a corrupted state where the Boris Johnsons of the world are representatives of finance and they're well re rewarded by finance, both directly and indirectly. And I've documented that. Thank you. Maranisha, perhaps a, a sort of more directly UK policy-based perspective on this. How do you think we can go forwards and uh, can we address these, these increasing inequalities. <laughs> Noel, it's a, I mean, someone who's more the, in, in directly related to work on government policy. I think you as a big picture guy, you know? Um, it's all right. First of all, th th thank you, Paul. And, and, and maybe what I'll do is um, try and compliment what, what Guy has already started us on in terms of the conversation. And I mean, just thinking about Emma's question, I'm, 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 reading, I'm reading it. And, and, and when Emma refers to going back to normal, um, I, I sincerely hope not. You know, in, in what I presented earlier, we know that inequalities were prevalent in, in our society. And yes, the pandemic has accentuated those, but we shouldn't go back to where we were, rather, we should be using this as um, an, an opportunity to, 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 to reflect and bring together efforts, not just um, from national governments, but also local governments, public health bodies, um, all of those who have a role to play business, um, local economies in, in trying to um, improve um, all of all of the factors that, that I'd mentioned earlier, we need um, to tackle the precarity um, that Guy and others have talked about. We need contracts, um, employment contracts that provide people with, with stability, good quality jobs. Um, we need good quality housing. The housing stock in the UK suffers um, from, from, from damp. Um, uh, vulnerability to, to overcrowding um, because of um, unaffordability. Um, these are these are variables. You know, low hanging fruit that 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 can be that can be addressed. Um, in in the work that that we're doing for the COVID impact inquiry, the report that that we'll be publishing early July, we are making some high level recommendations on on some of these factors, um, including education. Um, it, it, the, the, the other critical issue that I'd mentioned earlier is the role of mental health and improving mental health, um, because that feeds into people's abilities to, 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 to do jobs, um, gain an education, really open up further the, these, these opportunities for, for health and well-being. So definitely there are actions there, and there are actions that are being evidenced um, by um, work not just of the Health Foundation, but organizations like the Institute of Fiscal Studies, um, some of the work that Runnymede and others have also done. So yeah, a, a, few, a, a few pointers and, and suggestions there, Paul. Alfredo, any, any thoughts? Um, I think ne neoliberalism breeds inequality. If you leave the system to run, it will tend to create more and more inequalities in all, across all aspects of life, not just uh, income or wealth inequality, but also health inequalities and other types of inequality. And this was highlighted here um, today. A critical thing to stop these inequalities growing is tax reform. And this has been 
uh, has come onto the political agenda very, very strongly uh, recently, and that's an absolutely crucial uh, lever for uh, for change. But we need much more than this, and 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 the uh, what has sustained um, this this proposal for tax reform, particularly in the United States at the moment, in my view, is the realization that another round of fiscal austerity, repeating what happened after the 2007 crisis. And, that, that, and, the, and a new round of fiscal austerity was the initial response, the tendency from several governments, including clearly the British government, but also I think other governments too. But it was the realization that the attempt to do this would lead to or could lead to a political explosion. And I think the BLM uh, revolt in the United States, the biggest political revolt in that country in several decades, that showed the limits uh, of what um, neoliberal governments could do. And it showed limits that the Biden administration decided not to try and cross. So the, uh, they have reversed course and they're now moving towards uh, realization that tax reform is essential. You cannot squeeze the poor and you cannot squeeze public services uh, anymore. All the low hanging fruit has already been taken. The state has, dis has been dismantled to a very large extent. So now is the time to tax the rich uh, and to uh, achieve uh, at least the containment of the inequalities that neoliberalism tends to generate. But we need more than this. We need job stability. We need uh, economic security for the majority of people. We need welfare guarantees for the majority of people in order to build a minimally cohesive society. Now, this, I think, can be... Um, we can point to those outcomes around the decommodification of social life and the definancialization of social reproduction. And I think political activity along those uh, axes would be very popular. It would um, point to um, felt needs by many, many uh, millions of people. And it could um, point to a way to confront neoliberalism and financialization, a way that is uh, popular and constructive. We can't do, do politics just by uh, rejecting or denying what exists. We need to have a positive platform. And I think those uh, types of projects and programs uh, potentially could offer a way forward uh, transcending neoliberalism. Um, I am afraid I'm going to have to jump in at this point because we've hit um, half seven, which was our hard deadline. But I just want to um, really reiterate my thanks to all of you panelists for attending this evening. I think the things that stood out for me really were the, the what connects all of your kind of fascinating presentations was the imbalance of power. You know, for Mary Nisha and, and Zubaida, it was experiencing kind of inequalities along kind of minority and racial lines and explaining that is due to the kind of rife power imbalances in this in the system that we live in which is neoliberalism and capitalism i think that what the thing that worries me is when as guy pointed out late income from labor is systemically fractional of the income from wealth how where does that leave democracy and is democracy fit to solve these issues and will it come from within you'd like to hope um, this conversation has gone for a very long time, so I think we'll have to leave it there. But again, thank you so much. Tomorrow morning's panel will be on um, uh, gender with some fascinating, again, equally fascinating speakers. Um, so please do check out our website. You can use the same Zoom link. We will sort out the terrible technical issues we had this morning. So I'd like to apologize for that once more. And I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>